Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to the Elitist Geek VR News for Sunday, November 13th, 2016. Let's jump right into VR, guys. Start with a bit of gaming preamble. Uh, the first game, Counterfight, from developer Tricall for the HTC Vive. It comes to us via Exidy, my buddy of Friday Night Gaming Nights. And, you know, if you look at this game and think or know that it looks very familiar, yeah, you you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't be making a mistake. It looks a lot like the restaurant portion of Job Simulator. Now you are a ramen soup merchant. The whole point of this is to maintain high energy levels, serve your clientele, and you know avoid safely avoid or not so safely the shenanigans that ensue during the course of a typical workday, including getting robbed by yakuza and all kinds of other stuff happening. You also, like I said, have to watch your energy levels. You do that via energy drinks from Chinese cheerleaders. I'm not making this stuff up, guys. Uh, anyways, the game looks like uh, a little bit of a humorous, charming game. It'll be available November 14th. Can't say if it's, if it's good. I'm going to say it looks, quote-unquote, cute. And we're just going to leave it at that. Uh, probably won't be picking this up unless... It's really, really cheap on a Steam sale, like, you know, this Christmas. But uh, for some of you, that might be the type of game you're looking for, so there it be. All right, also have uh, some updates to Revive on GitHub. They've also got a link to their compatibility list. You can see there's some changes there. So if you are some uh, a Vive user who uses Revive, uh, go check it out. If you haven't been in a few months, there have been some updates. Maybe that game you were waiting for now works. I suspect there's going to be quite a few working once the touch gets released, but we'll have to wait and see. So let's jump into news, and we have a lot to talk about here. We've had some updates from TPCast, or rather from HTC Vive on the TPCast unit. Now, I announced uh, the, the unit. I also talked about, you know, um, tempering my enthusiasm, right? Being cautiously optimistic that it's going to work out. Well, we have more concrete details to talk about. In fact, one of these snippets is going to be a separate news slash update piece I'm going to do right after this. But here's where we're going to start. We're going to start with the frequency. So as suspected, or speculated rather, uh, it's not going to operate on 2.4 or 5 gigahertz due to latency. Instead, it is going to run on 60 gigahertz. Now, coming up after this, I'm going to specifically zero in on 60 gigahertz. If you're not familiar with the format, have a look at that. I think it's going to answer a lot of questions, specifically safety, because I've heard a lot of talk about the dangers of 60 gigahertz. And, well... Watch the second news update right after this, and we'll talk about that. So, they have finally addressed the latency issue, or have they? Uh, TPCast has come out and stated 15 millisecond latency. What they didn't specify, if that's 15 milliseconds additional latency, or 15 milliseconds latency, period. Now, keep in mind, the sweet spot for virtual reality, regardless of device is roughly 20 milliseconds latency time, right? So the time it takes the data signal for your movement actions, your tracking actions to hit the game code, you know, you do something and then the reaction on screen, 20 milliseconds or faster. That's typically the standard. So again, is it 15 milliseconds period or 15 milliseconds on top? 15 milliseconds on top you know, wouldn't be the preferable out of those two by any means. You would want the 15 period, obviously, because that could bring it up theoretically to 35 milliseconds, which for a lot of games would make a huge difference in terms of immersion, uh, smoothness, etc. But we'll wait for them to clarify. We also have received some sketch concept updates on the battery and additional details on the battery itself and an upgraded version of the battery. So the battery itself, I'd mentioned, was 90 minutes. 
they've got an upgraded battery. Now, on their website, they say two to five hours charge. Now, that is a huge variability from two to five. So let's be conservative and let's just say, you know what, two to three. Let's give that benefit, but let's not get into four or five. Let's just assume two to three hours, three probably comfortably. That would be double the other battery, right? The default battery that it ships with. Now, three hours, to me, 90 minutes would have been okay. Obviously, three hours is much better. And on a heavier, or I'd say, yeah, the average heavy VR day for me is about three hours, two to three. So for me personally, it would fit right in. For those of you who do more VR, yeah, even with the heftier battery pack, you're going to be challenged. And with the lower one, forget about it. It's, uh, it's probably not going to be what you need. But uh, let's get into the specifics now with 60 gigahertz. Let's dispel some myths and let's talk about facts. What we know about 60 gigahertz. Now I'm going to put up a table here. And the table is going to show the major networking protocols that we've essentially been using the last 20 years. And you can see they build up right to 802.11 AD, which is this 60 gigahertz. All the other ones operated within the 2.4 to 5 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz bandwidth. This one at 60. And there's pros and cons to that. So let's, let's talk about what some of those uh, features are. So first of all, it is very fast. And you can see that on the table, 7 gigabits per second fast, which is huge. That is about twice as fast as the 8-band 802.11 AC, 11 times faster than 802.11 N, which is quite a bit older, but still. The benefits of this are 4K video. Now, if you're saying, well, wait a minute, I was streaming 4K before. Yeah, you were, but you were doing it with compression. <laughs> the beauty of this standard is it's going to be able to stream without compression, natively raw signal, which is awesome. That's going to mean huge differences in visual quality, uh, especially if you're susceptible to you know, being able to see compression artifacts. And that is something that, especially here in Canada, I don't know how it was for you guys in other parts of the world, but when we first got the HD signals, they were so heavily compressed uh, over the cable, over the air, beautiful, uncompressed. I think I got two or three uncompressed HD channels over the air. But uh, through your cable, yeah, they were terrible. It's gotten better though. The other benefits uncongested and unlicensed spectrum. So you basically don't have a lot of crossover traffic in that range because it's so new and where it operates. So the big question, well, before we get into the safety aspect, let's just talk about one more thing. And that has to do with the 60 gigahertz signal itself and obstructions. Now, that is absolutely true. If you've heard that it really needs visual point A to point B, you're correct. It absolutely does. It cannot penetrate walls. So unless you're using something like beam forming, yeah, you can have it reflect off floors, ceilings, walls, absolutely. But default standard visual point A to visual point B unobstructed for the 60 gigahertz signal. Now, the 60 gigahertz signal, how safe is it? Because that's been a question. You know, people are cautious about it, and rightfully so. The beauty of the 60 gigahertz signal is that it cannot, and I'll say that again, it cannot pass through the human body. The moisture in our skin actually blocks the 60 gigahertz signal. And uh, I'll include some links. You can check that out. But that raises the immediate question. <laughs> well, what if you obstruct point A to point B, and it can't get its signal because you're turned around. And that is a valid question and one which we don't currently have an answer for. What we can talk about is what other companies that are using 60 gigahertz do in the event of obstruction, when something blocks the signal. What most of them end up doing is falling back on 5 or 2.4 
gigahertz. Now, what would be the ramifications in, of that in a VR setting? The biggest one, latency. Uh, pixelation, because suddenly you're able to push much less data across. Now, that would be kind of the last piece of the puzzle for me personally, again, you know, tempering enthusiasm and excitement that I would want to know from TPCast and HTC Vive specifically is if the signal is blocked, what happens? Do we lose tracking? Does the screen just black out? Does it have a fallback to five gigahertz, even with added latency? What happens? And like I said, the human body does block that signal. Unlike 2.4 and 5, which can pass through our bodies, the 60 gigahertz cannot. So uh, we've had some questions answered. Unfortunately, we've had some additional questions raised. So be interesting to see what the answers to those are. And hopefully over the next few weeks and months, we find out. Next news story, venture capitalists uh, contemplate how much exuberance is good for virtual reality investing. So this is an actual, uh, actually an interview up on Upload VR interview between the uh, magazine, I think it's actually Venture Beat. Uh, Toby Zhang, who is co-founder of venture fund Yuko Global Media Fund, Marco Demores, a partner of the $50 million venture reality fund, and finally Michael Yang, who is managing director at Comcast Ventures, uh, I believe in California, I think it's the San Francisco area. So a few questions were asked during the interview. Now, as usual, I'll include the link. You can read it in its entirety if you want. I'm just going to go summarize some of the points. One of the, uh, I'll go through some of the questions that were asked and just a summary answer. So one of the questions, are companies who do VR starting to generate revenue? The answer, and it's a politically correct one from these guys, because remember, they have vested interests in this. So you take those answers with a grain of salt. Uh, they answered essentially that it's still too early to tell. What will the impact of web VR be was another question. Now, they both or all three indicated Google and Oculus are currently supporting the standard. Uh, but the big impact, and this was an interesting point, is that web VR is going to extend use for virtual reality HMDs beyond what we have now. So instead of, you know, 360 media content, cinema content, games, experiences, the crossover into all different types of areas, education, healthcare, uh, all of those different areas. Hell, just surfing your website are going to be uses for it. But specifically you for an end user, it means potentially not having to take off your HMD for every little thing. So you're in a VR game, You'll want to check, uh, you know, a hint out. I'm looking something up, uh, maybe a trade database in Elite Dangerous. Instead of having to take the HMD off or do the, uh, you know, the peek underneath, I can switch over via Web VR functionality if the website supports it, and be able to do all of that within the HMD and seamlessly switch back into my game. So for consumers, that's the huge one. But like I said, web VR and all those other areas has potential as well. So depending on the adoption rate, ultimately, that's going to be the big unknown. How, how is this going to be received web VR? It has certainly the potential to see us have way more increased use out of our HMDs. That's the part that I'm excited about most. And then the, uh, the last story, Steam VR to get Linux and Mac OS support. First talked about this October 12th. At that point in time, they were very skeptical and had indicated they were likely going to put the Mac OS X stuff on hold because of the number of Mac capable machines not being that high. So it looks based on this uh, report today that they did in fact not halt the development and do in fact have a Mac OS X version ready, a beta version that they're going to launch within the next few months and a Linux version. So those Mac users who do have a video card that's capable at the low end should be able to use Steam VR functionality. So that is good news and definitely for people using Linux. All right, guys, that's it for the news. As always, cheers. Have a great Sunday and end to the weekend. Cheers, guys. Catch you on the VR flip side.